We love Music of the Masters. How many of you have been to our Music Masters concerts before? How many have not? Yay, good! <laughs> we have some students who haven't been to our Music of the Masters concerts yet because they're freshmen. Um, but it's a, it's a really exciting event and I want you to know, I always want to remind you um, that uh, as I reminded the students yesterday after our dress rehearsal, um, this kind of music, especially with orchestra, is just not done at the community college level. Uh, very rarely do they do students get to sing with orchestras and all that. But this year at Casper College, because we're so awesome, uh, they, the students have gotten to sing with orchestra actually quite a bit. Uh, they started this whole season. A lot of the, the singers got to sing with the Wyoming Symphony on Beethoven's Ninth Symphony back in October, and that was that was really really great. We got to sing with orchestra again at Christmas uh, during our tapestry concerts, and we get to sing with orchestra again today. Uh, this time though, we're doing this wonderful serious Baroque music. So. Let me tell you a little bit about Antonio Vivaldi. Um, I start with this uh, little story. Um, how many of you have heard Vivaldi's Four Seasons before, the concertos before, all of them? Yes, very nice. I can remember very clearly the first time I heard all of them. I, of course, encountered some of them at, uh, you know, ca casually as a, as a child. But when I was in college about... Uh, well, about 20 years ago, 21 years ago, I think, um, I went to a concert at the University of South Dakota where there is the National Music Museum, if you didn't know that, the University of South Dakota. Um, it's really incredible. It is the greatest collection of historical musical instruments in the country. In South Dakota. I know, it's, it's crazy. But one thing they have there is a, a lot of very old string instruments from the, from the like glory days of string instruments, including several Stradivarius made, actually made by Antonio Stradivari, uh, violins. And there was this, this recital, the Harrison Strad, that they have there. This is a violin that's worth, 20 years ago they said it was worth about $2 million. But this is a very special Stradivarius, because there are several. Um, there are several uh, um, professional players who do play on Stradivarius instruments, but this one was really special, because this one has not been modernized at all. It, does, it has its original neck, because a lot of old violins, to, to handle the pressure of, of modern strings and things, they, the, they would take them apart and put new necks on them later on. This one has not done that. So this is a real, real period instrument, the kind of one that a soloist would have played on the original Vivaldi Four Seasons. So this instrument was made in 1693, and it was made only, uh, you know, uh, 25, 30 years before the, uh, before the Four Seasons were written. It's pretty incredible. And so it was really fun to, to hear all the Four Seasons played on this instrument uh, with the chamber orchestra there. And I just remember that really, really clearly. And this is the kind of instrument, once they played it for that concert, they put it back in the vault. And they're only going to bring it out about every 25 years. So it's due pretty soon, right? So keep, keep your eyes open. Anyway. And that was just a little bit of introduction, because actually, when we talk about Vivaldi, when we talk about the music that we're going to listen to today, um, that's really, really tied up with the history of string instruments. It really is, because it wasn't until the Baroque era, starting in about 1600, uh, that, that instrument, instrumental ensembles, purely instrumental music, really started to take off and get its own life. And so it is kind of tied up in, in this old history. So. Like I said on the slide here, the Baroque era was a, was a big age of experimentation. Uh, they were putting together instruments in, in ensembles and combinations that they'd never really done before. And, and they, they experimented a lot. It's hard for historians to go back sometimes and like categorize pieces of music because of that. Because they're, they're, the ensembles are so different. And there was also a lot of... A lot of uh, kind of inventive uh, work on instruments in here, in, in the 1500s and the 1600s. So they were trying out a lot of, a lot of new things, and uh, the big genre that um, 
the big genre that influenced all of the Baroque era was opera. Opera was all about drama. It was also a, a kind of a radical simplification of what came before, uh, where we were focusing basically on the, 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 the melody line and, a, and the fundamental bass underneath it, rather than the really complex polyphony of the, that we know in the Renaissance. And this all influenced our, our instrumental music of the time. All right, so let's see. Just a little bit of history about violins. Uh, violins, uh, there were stringed instruments for a very long time, but this is the age where the, the late 1500s and the 1600s, um, kind of leading up to Vivaldi's time, this is when the modern string instruments were developed. Uh, they had their antecedents in things like the medieval fiddle, and one thing that happened during the late 1500s especially is in instrumental music, all of the instruments that existed, the you know, cornettos and other things like that, they took them, the ones that were kind of handed to them at the early Renaissance, and they started to turn them into consorts. So what they would do is they'd take a type of instrument and they'd make a whole bunch of different sizes of that same kind of instrument, and then they would have them play together as an instrument family, right? Like, think of a string quartet, right? Two violins, a viola, and a cello. They're all basically the same instrument, they're just different sizes, so you can play in different ranges. Well, this was happening a lot during the, during the 1500s, and so we started putting together these ensembles that you would call a violin consort. And so you'd have very large violins, very small violins, and even medium-sized violins. Sounds like a children's story, I don't know. But anyway, so, th so this is what was happening. And the, and the violin itself, as we know a violin, the soprano violin, was, was an instrument that didn't have quite as much prominence at the, at the kind of the turn of the 1600s. But gradually, over the course of the 1600s, gained a lot more popularity. Um, and so, uh, especially because uh, early on, it was used basically for accompanying dances. And, and that was its primary use. But then gradually, as it was used more often, especially as the chief melody instrument in operas and other dramatic works like that, where you'd have a basso continuo, a little harpsichord, and a cello, or a viola da gamba or something, but then also you'd have a violin. Your violin was a, a higher instrument that, that was a, a melody instrument. So it started to outgrow its, its use as just dance accompaniment. And then when we get through to the later 1600s, or the mid 1500s to the, great, to the 1600s, we see the era of the great violin makers. I already mentioned Stradivarius. Um, and here I'm gonna whet your appetite for going to the National Music Museum, but it's closed for renovation, so don't even try. Um, it's been closed since COVID for renov renovation, so I, it better be really spectacular when they open it up again. Um, so the great violin maker is the first truly great violin maker, and this is in the, in the Italian city, northern Italian city of Cremona. That became kind of the capital, the capital of violin making, where the best makers were. Um, Andrea Amati, in 15, this is a, a violin of his in 1559, looks fairly familiar, doesn't it? We've, even by 1559, we've pretty much settled on the general design of a violin. Um, I'll tell you that National Music Museum is the only place that you can go to in the world where they have a complete family of instruments that was uh, built by Andrea Amati. Uh, so they have violins, violas, and cellos. It's quite, uh, quite incredible. And then his son, kind of his two sons actually, kind of took up the next generation, uh, and they were they were known as the bro the brothers Amati. That's where you'd get your violin, um, and 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 so they kind of took the next generation. And you can see that violin also looks fairly similar, um, made several decades later. And then finally. Uh, Niccolo Amati's famous student, most famous student, Antonio Stradivari. Um, and, he, and here's another picture of that Harrison Strad from the National Music Museum. So the violin is, not, is, is kind of settled in design at this point. We would, we would hear the, as compared to some other instruments that were being played in the Baroque era that might look a little different today, uh, violins are fairly similar to what they, they used to be back then. So. You know, if you look closely, you can see subtle, subtle differences and variations in the size and shape and, and other things. Uh, they, they experimented with what parts of the logs to take the different parts of the instrument from and, and all of that. So there's a lot of interesting, it's of course a much more nuanced thing than I'm getting through right now, this history of violin making. But 
just know, this is kind of setting the stage for the world that Vivaldi uh, occupied next. So uh, one big thing that happened in the Baroque era is that the instruments start outgrowing the concept of a consort. A consort is like a modern equivalent, kind of like a string quartet. But later in the era, we went from consort to what we would call an orchestra. And the, chief, and the, the, the defining factor that makes a consort not an orchestra or an orchestra is that we get to the point where more than one person is playing the same part. That's, that's the, that, that is the defining difference. And so early orchestras, one of the earliest orchestras uh, was at Versailles, the 24 violins of the king. It was hard to have a whole lot of people in an orchestra unless you had lots and lots of money. Uh, so king of France, Louis XIV, late 1600s, he had, he had a, a little bit of money, I don't know, building Versailles and all that. But you can see uh, in this picture, it's not a very good one, but here's a, an opera performance in, uh, at, at Versailles. And you can see the crowd in the front, but you, and you can also see the, the violins split in two, two groups on the side there, and then the opera in the middle. So kind of interesting. So that's another thing that's happening here is the rise of the orchestra, or what we would call an orchestra. In Italy, in the late 1600s, the most prominent comp composer was Arcangelo Corelli. Uh, Corelli is, is, the, is the person who set a lot of the genres that we, that we would write in later on. Like I said, this is an era of great experimentation of how you would put instruments together. Um, but Corelli uh, gave us, or at least codified, some distinct genres that a lot of people would write in. So for instance, uh, concertos. Concerto is a word, whenever you see that word, talking about anything in the Baroque, it just means with instruments, okay? So, so if you even see a vocal concerto or something, that means you're gonna have voices, and darn it, there's gonna be instruments too, okay? Um, so every time you see you versions of that word, that's, that's what you're gonna get. So a concerto, in its more broad sense, compared to how we usually use that word today, um, is a, a piece written for instruments. So an orchestral concerto is, is one where the whole orchestra, the whole orchestra is, is playing together and they're playing a, a multi-movement piece of music that has some contrasting sections and, and things like we would expect an orchestral concerto. Um, a, the other really big genre that was going on in the, in the late Baroque here was the concerto grosso, where there is a solo group of instruments in the, in the middle, often like two violins and a, two violins and a cello. Um, there's also all, often that solo group. And then there, at various parts, the whole orchestra um, joins in. So it's kind of like a little consort piece. And then you add in the whole orchestra, because remember the defining feature is that it is um, more than one player on a part. All right. So. The, the word that we are typically, in our day though, that we hear when we hear the word concerto, we think of a solo concerto, right? And that, where if you go to the symphony, go to Wyoming Symphony or something, and like next week, or, or two weeks from now, they're gonna have a piano concerto. Well, what do you expect when you go to a piano concerto? Well, there's a piano, there's an orchestra, right? And the piano's playing solo, right? Solo concerto is kind of how we use that word most often now. That wasn't quite as cut and dry in the Baroque, but there were things called solo concertos and they were developing that genre. And Corelli was pretty substantial in that genre. Okay, so all of this is setting the stage for Vivaldi. Because Vivaldi would come up and, and rise as, to prominence as the most influential Italian instrumental music composer of the early 1700s, of the generation immediately after Corelli. Corelli established a whole lot of conventions for what these pieces uh, would, would be, and then uh, Vivaldi put his own stamp on it, and in some ways exhausted the genre. <laughs> and, and they had to come up with something, something new. So, a few things about Antonio Vivaldi. So, he was born in Venice, and Venice is where the Baroque era began. That's where the first experiments with opera uh, began in 1600. And Venice remained a very important opera, uh, city of opera for the, rest of the, for the rest of the era, for sure. Um, he was originally trained as a priest, and he was the son of a professional violinist. So no surprise that even though he was training as a priest, he was also a very fine violinist and would be prized as a violin soloist for his, during his career. 
After training as a priest, he got the post that would kind of define his career in a lot of ways. He was placed as a priest at the, the Pietà, which was, uh, has a much longer Italian name. It's in your program. I'm not going to try to remember it at, the, at this moment. But the Pietà, which was one of the orphanages, which is one of the orphanages in Venice. Now, orphanages then were very different than now. We, don't, we think of them kind of differently. This orphanage was for children, mostly illegitimate children of well-to-do people. And so they, they were actually pretty, pretty nice orphanages, and they would train all of these, uh, these young orphans in, uh, in, in music. And so they, they, when they put on their, their uh, religious services and other, other things, other informal things at the Pietà, they kind of became a social event. They came, uh, it was a thing for all the glitterati of the, of, the, of the town to come in here, because the music was fantastic. So he was hired not as a priest, per se, but Vivaldi was hired as the master of violins. He taught violin, he cared for all of the instruments, and that was his, that was his purview there, was, was all of that. So, so that's where he started. Um, when he was in, in his late 20s, he started publishing his first works um, he, when he was 27. And then uh, in 1709, he was... Uh, in 1709, he was let go for a couple of years, and he traveled around doing other things, and then he came back. And when he came back to the Pietà, he, he had an opportunity to not just be the master of violins, but of the entire musical, uh, the, all of the music that was going on there. The Maestro de Concerti, I believe is what his title was, the master of concerts, basically. And so he, he had to write a lot of music for, for the Pietà, and he wrote a lot of mainly solo concertos, lots and lots of solo concertos, which actually would work out really well at an orphanage. You could see how naturally that would work because you would have older students in their, in their late teens who would be really accomplished on whatever instruments, usually violins that they were working on, and then you'd have a lot of younger people who would be able to support them in an orchestra but were not yet soloists. So it makes, it makes a lot of sense why this would become the genre that he wrote in the most often. All right, a couple important uh, collections. Uh, in 1711, L'Estro Armonico, um, his first, that was kind of like his first big publishing hit. And so that kind of established his reputation as a composer, uh, this, this collection of, of pieces. And also in 1725, uh, that other collection, <coughs> what, I, Il Cimente dell'Armonia dell'Invenzione, yeah, something like that. Uh, and this is the collection of concertos that includes, that begins, it's opus number eight, it's the collection of concertos that begins with the Four Seasons. And the Four Seasons were unique, and we will talk about how unique they were um, in a minute. But first, just really quickly, talk about his reputation overall. Um, after he left the Pietà, uh, when he was about 40-ish, uh, he left the Pietà and didn't work for them anymore, except they commissioned him to write a bunch of concertos for them, even though he's doing other stuff. He was writing mainly opera at the time and traveling around quite a bit. And he had a reputation through his career of being, well, a little full of himself. Um, he, he could compose concertos with amazing speed. And he, he used to brag that he could write, write a concerto faster than the copyist could copy out the parts. Um, he, he was, and he did write a lot. If you see how many hundreds and hundreds of concertos he wrote for all sorts of instruments, he had to be writing pretty fast. But he also, he blustered about claiming that he had written 94 operas, and it, it was really more like 80, but hey, you know. Um, he, he, but he had this reputation of being a phenomenal violinist, a pretty good composer, and kind of full of himself. Uh, so we're not shocked that later in his career he was uh, dismissed for conduct unbecoming a priest. We are not sure what that was, but I don't know. There's some guesses out there. Um, and it was rumored that he had a mistress for some time as well. Uh, eventually, Vivaldi's uh, personality caught up with him, and he did die penniless. He was very rich for a time, and he died penniless. So, so that's fun, right? As far as his posthumous reputation, Vivaldi lived at a time where very rarely would you hear a piece of music that was written more than 10 or 15 years ago. It was really, really unusual to play music by a composer who was no longer living, and really unusual. All, all the, there's a, the appetite for new music from the public was just insatiable all the time throughout the Baroque. So some of these, yes, opera composers were writing dozens and dozens of operas because they would never last longer than a season. They just need new stuff, new stuff. So 
All of the composers of these days, many of them were forgotten completely the second they died. And some of them had a, a, a bit more staying power. Vivaldi had a bit more staying power. His work was shared pretty well throughout Europe. Uh, but, and, and his Four Seasons especially, the Four Seasons were, uh, were passed around and became kind of at least part of the semi-permanent repertoire of violin soloists in the 1700s. But he, like many composers, even Johann Sebastian Bach, disappeared. Uh, from, the, from public view after they died. Um, the good thing is, the great thing is, we may not have uh, known much about Vivaldi at all or had all these concertos in, in collection anymore, if, if not for the fact that uh, Mendelssohn revived the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. And so when Johann Sebastian Bach was rediscovered, everybody started looking back and said, hey, these Baroque guys were onto something. I wonder who else is back there. So a lot of scholarship followed Bach and, and, and revived a lot of other people too. And Vivaldi is one of those people. And so he has, I talked to the music history students about how whenever a new edition of the book <laughs> comes out, you page through it, you see what's changed. You can see composers stock like doing this over the course of time, going up and down based on how much of the book they get and how many musical examples they, they cite. Um, so Vivaldi has only become more popular since his rediscovery and more influential. Uh, and he was very influential. He was influential on Johann Sebastian Bach. So that's one of the reasons we talk about that. Okay. Um, all right, let me see. Okay. So now let's talk about um, what he did for the concerto. Okay. One thing that uh, Vivaldi did, and this is some of the influence that you see in the music of Bach and his contemporaries, is he established not the genre of solo concerto, but a lot of the conventions for it. And one of the most useful things he did for a solo concerto is to uh, create what we call ritornello form. <clears throat> and ritornello form is a form where the introduction, the orchestral introduction for, for the solo concerto is a really fun thing, but it's built out of all these little melodic units, usually only like two bars in length each. So when you listen to the introduction to a piece like this, um, the, the, the shape and the character of the melody changes about every two bars. Okay, this is the ritornello form. So that's the ritornello, which means to return in Italian. And then the soloist has their own episode. I mean, not like a crazy episode. Like that's what it's called. The soloist has an episode. Um, and then, and, and they, they play uh, parts of these little seeds. And then the orchestra comes back with all these little uh, incomplete pieces of the music that you heard initially. And then, it, and then there's little episodes from the soloist. But it's all kind of unified in that way. So we hear in the introduction what we're going to hear, all the material that's going to be varied for the rest of the piece. And this, this form of the opening movement of three of a solo concerto became a very important form that many others would follow. Um, the Four Seasons sadly don't follow that form at all. So I, you know, so I wanted to I'm going to play a little bit of his, uh, the beginning of his violin concerto in A minor, which follows this form. So here is the ritornello. Now the soloist, picking up the material from the ritornello. And then another 
another solo episode. So of course, uh, all of these things are much more subtle, but when you're going to listen to a Vivaldi concerto in something or other for some sort of instrument, listen for those kinds of forms. Like, ah, I hear everything I'm going to expect to hear, and then I hear the soloist riffing on it for a while. Um, riffing, I guess, exactly how Vivaldi told him to riff. Uh, but. <laughs> Right, riffing on it for a while, and then the orchestra comes back. There's all these little tonal guideposts through a piece of music. And in that little, I, how many notes did you just hear in 90 seconds, right? <laughs> There's just a lot of activity. And this is one thing I really love about Baroque music, and what you're going to hear today is the amount of energy that's inside it. Um, there's a lot of momentum moving all the time. Okay, so just before we got to Four Seasons, I wanted to talk about what he normally did. Now, the seasons was something different. <laughs> Um, and, and one of the reasons why it's prized. So the Seasons is a, is a piece of, it's, it's four concertos, and they are solo concertos, four solo concertos, and what's different about them is that they are, in, in a little way, programmatic. Now, programmatic music, you know, like where you're trying to paint a picture in music and all that, we are really used to it in our day and age. Uh, the Romantic era was just so full of program music uh, that, um, we're used to it, like, oh, here's a song about a river, and it sounds like a river. Here's a song about being on a mountain, it sounds like being on a mountain. You know, there's all these different things. But we have to step back in our minds to a time and a place when people hadn't done that before. Uh, they're, they're, they hadn't tried to paint pictures with music in purely instrumental music. And so in that way, these pieces were groundbreaking. The, the Four Seasons were published, and maybe you saw this in the program already, were published with poems. Poems that they meant that the, the pieces are meant to actually depict. Um, so it's not just, it's not just uh, songs that sound like spring or sound like summer or something. There's actually some specific, some specific pictures that he's trying to paint in here. And that is a, a new thing and something that everyone was going to get really excited about. Because um, we all know, we all know how spring, you can't, some of the music is just generally springy. Like... Yes, it's springtime, right? This sounds like springtime, sure. So, so some of the pieces are like that, where, where there's a, a, general, a, a general feeling, but then he couples with that some really specific pictures. Um, and, and we'll hear some of those today. We're only gonna hear summer today, so I wanna share with you just a couple, uh, a, a couple of other pictures. Now, there are antecedents for this, um, I, I mentioned up there the, the madrigal tradition. Uh, composers had been painting musical pictures with musical figures for some time, but it was primarily in vocal music. Uh, if you see in the late, the late 1500s, uh, composers were writing quite a few musical pictures into their music, and it's really neat. But doing it in an instrumental work was something very new, and it's pretty neat. So let's move along here. Do, do, do. Okay, some examples here. From Winter, the first movement from Winter, if you were at Tapestry, you heard all three movements of this before, uh, but the first movement from Winter, uh, the poem that's associated with it mentions a few different pictures that could be painted. Uh, wind, we know a lot about that, right? Chattering teeth and brisk running. Okay, those are things that the first, the poem, the, the poem with, uh, for the first movement of Winter talk about. So here's the beginning of Winter. Here's some chattering teeth, and the wind is about to come. So like I said, this isn't overly dramatic. These are early experiments, right? Early experiments with this painting, painting pictures. The second movement, similarly, and we're gonna have to go through this quickly, the second movement, the, the very brief poem that goes along with that, talks about the joy of kicking your feet up by a roaring fire as it's dripping rain outside. That's what it talks about in the, in the poem for the second movement. And that sounds like this. And you can absolutely hear the rain dripping. 
with the pizzicato strings in the background. And a melody that is certainly very pleasing and would be a wonderful thing to listen to as you sit by the fire. And it drips outside. Oh, so nice. And so that melody is a pretty good example of what we were talking about on the last slide when it said the affections, right? This is a big, a big thing that they worked on in the Baroque era, making sure they're painting emotion with musical material. Not even directly, but it, a, a piece of music, a melody has a certain affect to it. It was a, the old Greek things that they were going back to and, and trying to work with all the time. So that's a really good example of that. Um, so. There's a lot of uh, really, really neat stuff in there. We could listen to it all, but we're not going to. I'm running out of time already, but that's OK. Um, and then the third movement, there's pictures of slipping and falling on the ice. If you don't remember what that sounds like, go look it up. It'll be fine. Um, so summer, there's three pictures in summer here um, that, that shape the music that he, that he gives us for this, this concerto. The first movement is about hard work and being weary from hard work. And then, trembling at the fear of what might happen if a storm blew up, right? It blew up into the, the fields, right? That's, that's what the first movement is talking about. And we get those pictures in this music as well. Uh, the second movement is, uh, is the poem that's associated with that is talking about really trying to get rest from working hard, right? Summer is when you have to do all this hard work outside, and you're trying to get rest because you're weary. The story keeps going. But there's gnats and flies buzzing all around you. And then the third movement, if you look at that poem, um, the third movement is everything that you were scared of actually is going to happen now. The storm comes, it's pouring rain, and the hail is going to beat down all of your crops. That's a fun picture, right? <laughs> Maybe Vivaldi didn't like summer. I don't know. Maybe he... Um, What's this one? So here, here's an example from that third movement uh, where the storm arrives and we're sad. I encourage you, as we, as we uh, go through these pieces this afternoon, have that program open, right? So you can, you can read those poems along with them as, as the, the, the piece goes on, because the seasons is very exciting. Um, I'm going to rush ahead here just a little bit, so I won't, um, I won't give you all of those. Um, so a brief, a, a, a fewer remarks about the Gloria, which is the second half of the program today. Uh, the Gloria is one of, uh, or very possibly, Vivaldi's earliest sacred choral orchestral work that he ever wrote. It's a little bit from uh, his, the younger part of his career. But one thing, one reason that's prized so well and has such a, such a lasting staying power uh, in our day is one that it is, it is fairly accessible. Um, less capable choirs and orchestras can put it on, uh, easier than some other choral orchestral music like Beethoven 9 or something like that. Um, so, it's just more practically available. That's one of the reasons. But secondly, it is a real, I think I call it a, a, a compendium of, uh, of techniques that were used in the Baroque, in, in sacred music. And so we get all of these things. We get, these, we get grand fanfares. We get really uh, kind of turgid fugues and, and, uh, and all of these things, and, and bright solos and sad solos and all of these things uh, throughout the whole piece. And so we get to see all of these different flavors, all of these different styles that, that made the Baroque the Baroque era and made the music uh, what it was. Uh, for instance, um, to get two of those flavors in one, um, the, uh, which one is this? The movement uh, that is kind of in the middle of the entire piece, the Domine Fili Unigenite, is both a fugue and a fanfare at the same time. Um, and it's, it's just, 
uh, a wonderfully fun piece of music to listen to and to sing, I'll tell you. Um, And then, so that's one thing that we see, and we, we do see this, this kind of music in, in the, the seasons and other things. But one thing that we don't get in the seasons and the, the concerto music of Vivaldi that we do get in the sacred work is, is true fugues. Um, true fugal writing, which was, was a, a big thing in the Baroque, especially in the music of the, the German composers. Um, Vivaldi's fugues t and fugue subjects tend to be a little simpler, uh, a little bit more compact, just like an Italian. I don't know, I just, that's, that's how they do it. Um, so for instance, the closing fugue of, of the Gloria, which you, I hope, enjoy, is the Cum Sancto Spiritu. taste of the glory. You'll get to have the whole thing later on. Um, rounding out the program, just to give you just the other two works on there. The first, the first work on the program is a Vivaldi orchestral concerto, so that's that genre I was talking about before. And then, just to round it out, since we were reflecting on summer, it's not Vivaldi, but uh, a, a trio in chorus from The Seasons by Haydn. Uh, which is which is really fun, and I hope you hear when we when when you hear the contrast between when that's sitting in the middle of all these truly baroque pieces, and then there's that Haydn, which was written a good, you know, 70 years later. When you hear that, it is it is a, a very different feeling. It has a different kind of dance to it, uh, where the the um, uh, it's it's very sprightly and fun, and I hope you really enjoy it because we really like singing it too. But. That's all I have for a lecture. Got to go get the choir warmed up and all that. But I, I hope you learn something. I hope you in, enjoy the concert. And, and thank you for giving some of your afternoon to us today. So thanks.
on. Test. It's on. Thank you so much. Um, we are so excited to be here, even though it's apparently summer outside all of a sudden. <laughs> but thank you so much for giving a little bit of your afternoon to be inside with us. Um, and before we uh, do the hide-in, I have a few announcements, if I can read their handwriting. Um, I was trying to come up with the right word to attach to the right emotion. It's hard. So I started looking up all these words in different languages. It's really intriguing. Um, and I still didn't come up with one. So the closest one is bittersweet. Um, this is our last concert of the school year. And it's the last concert with a really special group of humans behind me. Um, this is my 22nd year at the college. And the way this all converged, I have no idea. I think it was a God thing. But these humans behind me, I've watched them grow and grow musically, treat each other like family. They do family dinners after rehearsal on Monday nights, um, take care of each other, make sure they have the right color of socks even. <laughs> <laughs> and just <sighs> incredible. So I want to recognize all of the students on the stage who are um, graduating and or leaving and leaving the nest bittersweet. So um, I'm reading these in no particular order. There's no hierarchy here. I love them all equally, and they know that. Jack. Jack Larson has been a member of the orchestra stand-up for a couple of years. He um, graduated from Natrona County High School and now is going to the University of Wyoming um, after he um, finishes his uh, coursework here at Casper College for chemistry and will be participating in the UW Summer Research Program in Chemistry on Laramie's campus. So thank you for your dedication to our orchestra, Jack. We're going to miss you. Evan. Evan Whipple is a sophomore in high school and he's been playing with us for a couple of years um, and has decided he needs to go be in a bigger pond. I don't blame him. There's not a lot of us that do this in Wyoming. There's just not a lot of us. And so he will be attending Interlochen Arts Academy this coming fall as a junior in high school majoring in violin performance. Samuel Schneider, who played the cello solos, um, is graduating with an AA in secondary education. You're doing pre practicum work at Kelly Walsh right now, right, in history? And he's heading to UW to pursue a bachelor's in secondary education, emphasis in history. And he'll be playing cello with the University of Wyoming Symphony with, under a, they gave him a scholarship, a pretty nice scholarship. So go Sam, and he's gonna keep playing cello down in Laramie. So, next him. Thanks for playing. Riley Graham, that's a funny story because I told her to come play with us a few years ago. She was, there was, you were walking in the music building, you had a bass, I was like, you play bass, come play. And I literally dragged her into rehearsal. <laughs> Next thing we know, she's playing with us. She'll be serving clinicals over the um, fall to obtain an associate's in medical laboratories technology and pursue a bachelor's in medical laboratory science at UW at Casper College. Um, continuing biomedical research for um, the University of Wyoming when she finishes there and probably playing some bass. So thank you for playing with us these past few years, Riley. <laughs> Rachel Merchant has been <laughs> in my orchestra for, I think this is six years. She started when she was in high school. She's been an anchor in this program. Um, and she's out of here too. <laughs> Rachel will be graduating with her associates in science um, pre-med and will continue her education at the University of Wyoming in the fall. She will pursue a bachelor's in physiology. physiology. You wrote psychology, FYI. I was a little, I was distracted. That's what I thought. Oh, yeah, I um, physiology, that's what I thought, um, before applying to medical school. So.
and Michael Vitanzo, who was just featured. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Um, and the Valdi, we found each other on Zoom during COVID. And I coached him on Zoom, and he was living in Pinedale. What? Yeah, and his bow broke uh, over Zoom. I was like, oh my God. Um, and I sent you one. No? I don't remember. Yeah, I think I mailed you a, a bow to use for a little bit. Um, he, um, he was part of the National Youth Orchestra's program at Carnegie Hall a couple summers ago. It was a high, it's a high school program and needed some lessons because he was trying to teach himself how to play violin, if you can believe it, and um, playing in the band in Pinedale. And, um, and then he shows up here, and he's graduating with his uh, associates in violin performance, heading down to the University of Wyoming um, to continue his education in violin performance on full ride scholarship, playing with the University of Wyoming Symphony, um, and he will be auditioning. He actually just completed um, an audition for a professional orchestra. He will find him in a professional orchestra probably in the next, I'll give you five years. So. Congratulations. So give us just a second to reset and we'll uh, present the Haydn seasons for you.
Well, I just want to say a quick thank you before we get started. Thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. It's, it's extra special because the weather is so nice. I know, because that, that's a real sacrifice. I, I, but I trust that you're excited about summer now, so that we've heard all this summer music and, and all that. But I just wanted to thank you before we even get started with this second half of the program here, the Vivaldi Gloria, uh, for, for spending your afternoon with us. This is a truly special thing that doesn't happen very many places to uh, play choral orchestral music here with these students. So, we're, so thank you so much for coming and we hope you really enjoy Vivaldi's Gloria. <laughs> 